in Jesus' name. I am going to uh, bring some stuff and ask you to participate with me. Not, we don't want this to be a uh, just a one-way lecture. I'm going to I'm going to dare to do something, but I'm I am taking my starting point out of uh, the book of Ezekiel. When's the last time you were in Ezekiel? Chapter 1, verse 1. Shall we go there? Amen. Now, a lot of people know certain things out of the book of Ezekiel. That's one of those books people take things out of but don't necessarily read it all. So I'm going to ask a question. Um, just, just hold that right there. Um, if I don't remember your name, it's just because I'm getting old. I've said your name before. I'm not going to say it's not Larry. It's, say, yeah, I'm pointing right. Yeah, what's your name again? Noah. Noah. Man, how, who can't remember Noah? I can't. And I've said it before. I said it right now, and I'll mess up again. Um, if I asked you in, in uh, the book of Ezekiel for one thing that you remember out of Ezekiel, could you give me one thing? A vision of dry bones. Classic. How many know that's out of the book of Ezekiel? We're in class, so everybody raise your hand. Yeah. Very good. Um, anybody else can give me a highlight? One thing, though. Brother Caprio. I don't remember his name. Brother Caprio. Gog Magog. Now, that's probably one of the bigger ones. Um, anyone else got a highlight out of the book of Ezekiel? Major prophet, Isaiah, Sister Carpenter. The wheel in the middle of a wheel. Everybody remember that one? Come on, anybody else? Participation. You get a ribbon on your chart or a sticker. Anybody else re remember something out of the book of Ezekiel? Wait a minute, you've got to raise your hand. Yes. The what? The four-headed cherubims. Yes. The rest of you are intimidated or scared or don't know. Come on, give me another one. Bro where, where is he? Brother Stewart. Four horsemen. Okay, uh, chariots, four chariots, uh, four something. Ezekiel. I don't know it all either. I just, I'm just fresh off reading it, so I, I, I'm not a know-it-all, but I wanted to have a little bit of something to go on with here. Highlights, the wheels, uh, Gog Magog, uh, the creatures, the four creatures, the Valley of Dry Bones, um, and some difficult areas. Here is Ezekiel, one and one. Now it came to pass in the, the uh, 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Um, this is the second time that Nebuchadnezzar went back to uh, Israel and grabbed a bunch of uh, um, slaves and captives. And here's this Ezekiel. I don't know if he's young like Daniel and those guys were, but this is not a happy man. He's, he's, he's being taken to a country he's probably never been to. He's now a, he's going to serve a master. He's, he's not in his own country. He's not free no more. Um, he's seen families burned and killed and put to the sword and buildings. And he's seen, like, the war-torn everything. Not a happy guy, just miserable as he could probably be. And they're walking through 
wildernesses to get somewhere not happy. And you can imagine in your own life what it takes for you to get into the mully grubs, what it takes for you to, well, you know, we get upset if the dog has an accident in the house or, you know, these people would think that our worst problems in life would be heaven. That's, that's really true. We cry over what some people would call answered prayer. And we cry for those things. And so here's a man that really, when you think about it, but then again, even in God's eyes, that may not even be so. Because if you see Paul and Silas, they were in a, not a modern sanitary prison, if you can think there is such a one, but, but in theirs, can you imagine how nasty that was? And yet they, they could find the uh, character and the disposition to sing praise and worship. And here in Ezekiel, we see somebody that, that well, we don't have any insight into his heart, but I do know that, that right when he's telling us that I'm a prisoner and I'm in a foreign land and I'm, we, we stopped by this river, and in the, in the worst situation, God decided to talk to him. That's reason for hope. And he did not start off by going, why, God, why? You know, everybody, we hear it all the time. People question God, why, God, why, why? This guy didn't do that. It's God talking. Enough said. I don't know what's going on in your life. You could be in a situation that's wretched. I, some people right, maybe in this room right now have such serious uh, issues going on in their life. But the same God that decided to speak to Ezekiel is here tonight. More in, because he, he likes to talk to everybody now. Before he was kind of like just very specific. Now he wants to talk to everybody. Anybody can hear from God if they want to. Uh, that's sweet performance there. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, but I'm not a captive. So there's some places in. I didn't bring you the date. This, like before Jesus came in the world, this is like a half a millennium before he got here. God has always been trying to uh, give us more than enough material to look back on Ezekiel how did I get along so long without ever really reading through the book of Ezekiel I do not know there's some such magnificence up there if the word of God does not excite you you're in trouble and if the word of God doesn't start calling to you to come look into my pages and and don't be such a hurry that, that the tyranny of the urgent what do you got to do so bad that you can't sit down and really give some of those intricate areas some attention. There's some jewels waiting that you're never going to find because you're in such a hurry. Who got time for the Word of God? Got time for everything else. That's right. Martha and Mary, the tyranny of the urgent. We got chores to do. We'll do the Bible last. All right. Carried captive, prisoner. Um, so, um, let's see. My own writing. Yes. I saw this little story about a mouse. And this researcher, somebody, I don't know, he's drowning mice. You know, they do everything to these mice terrible job he's they're drowning mice to see what happens it's like a bunch of sick kids or something and they notice these ma mice drown please don't hold me to the numbers uh because I, I may not be quoting exactly but these mice drowned within 15 minutes 
And um, so they decided to, right before they drown, they'd take him out of the water. And uh, sounds kind of cruel. And the mouse revived. And then they put the mouse back in the water. <laughs> Do you know how long those mice lasted the second time? I think he said uh, 60 hours as opposed to 15 minutes. And they, they figured out that the reason why they didn't drown it within 15 minutes is because they had hope that this guy was going to reach in there and pull them out again. And they wanted to stay alive knowing that there was something that could deliver them. And that's how people are. People that have no hope, just let her go. They said that about the prisoners in Korea, the ones that rolled over and died because it was so bad. They weren't Christians. They had no hope. The Christians hung in there because they had a belief in a delivering God. The Bible even refers to the blessed hope, looking for the blessed hope for that God to reach down in his flood. And we hang on because we believe in and so people wonder why we're the way we are, because we have hope that there is a God that will deliver us. Um, turn with me to the second chapter. Any questions? Man, I've been places where hands will go up. What color are the spokes of the wheels? There is no answer to that, but at least... Somebody give me an ignorant question. And we won't call it ignorant, but somebody ask me a question pertaining to the topic. Don't ask me politics. We're not doing that. I don't want to know that you voted for Biden. I don't care. Ezekiel, um, second chapter, uh, verse 1. And he said unto me, one and he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him speak unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children, and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among thee. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. So Ezekiel was given a call. He had his religious, his experience with God, and God's given him gifts like visions. He's seeing things, just like the Holy Ghost, your children shall see visions. He's got all that going, and now that God says, I am calling him, and I want you to speak, and I want you to tell the church, now, answering that kind of call, you know, you're going to get run out of town because they ain't right. Somebody goes preaching at church, and you know that when you get there, this is a, a church that they haven't had a move of God in 20 years. They're stiffer than a, than a wooden Indian in front of the tobacco shop. They wouldn't move if there was free, if there was money given. They'd just stiff. Because, they, you know, when you get into a certain thing, they're like, it, it, what's it going to take? And then you get in a, one, a good church, and people, just because they're in church, they're, they're lubricated, they're oiled up, they're ready to go. They've been praying, and they've been praying, and, they, and they, they've been raised right and know how to act in church. And, and that's a good church, and the Word of God is freely moved, and you don't have to get a jackhammer out and chip away at the concrete before you can finally get to a nerve. No, but this church is like the one where it's going to take judgment. And if you read the book of Ezekiel, you see 
that it sounds a lot like judgment because there's a lot of judgment necessary. It's, it's, it, you can't get to the honey until you wade through the, the muck. It's the way of life. How many know that's how life is? I used to hate it when my dad say, you can't, you can't have honey until you wade through the muck. Brother Weaver, isn't that how it is? Most every job's that way. Everybody wants to be elevated and promoted. No, nobody wants a, a, a leader that ain't never waded through the muck. He don't know about muck. Can I get a hand clap? Yeah. You got to wade through it before. And so he tells them, this is Ezekiel's call. He called to uh, speak some judgment. Amen. Now the wheel that Sister Carpenter mentioned, the wheel, the wheel, the wheel, there's so many opinions on that. But, um, and those angels. You'll see um, this book is, because it's a prophet and it's considered one of the major prophets, only because it's a lot of chapters, not because he was better than Amos or Haggai or, you know, Habakkuk. It's just that their books were very little, so they were minor prophets, not meaning less of a person, just pages. How many understand that? Amen. Amen. So, um, Ezekiel said a lot of things, but if you will go through it, you'll see that he opens up with this spiritual visitation so that um, they can know that God is there. And he wants him to, them to, him to tell the people that. And those were probably, I'm, opinion, I'm going to opine, those were probably theophonic. That, those were manifestations of God or ambassadors of God. Was it, there was angels. If you look in Revelation, you see something like those angels. Faces may change, whether it's an ox or an eagle. But you'll see that the tribes of Israel, when they were around the tabernacle, each one, there was a flag that had an animal caricature on it. So there would be four points of the compass with these special cherubim type of creatures. And in Revelation, you'll see up there uh, the four, uh, they're angels, but they had these many wings and these faces. So whether it's the same ones or different ones is neither here nor there for me but it, they do seem to appear yes there's they even in this world they're still discovering new creatures so if there's creatures in heaven i'm not amazed it's not mythology but i've never seen it so i'm good with it being real amen i don't have to necessarily wait for a scientist to tell me when something's really real or not amen they do do that and you can buy books on all the mistakes they've made too amen they are not uh, absolute or superior I do appreciate a lot they've done especially air conditioners they didn't how should I say discover it in the real sense, it was always there. Nothing new under the sun. Everything that gets invented is in the fabric of reality that they pull out because they're made in the image of God and they have the create, creative ability to do that. No telling what's left. Well, there's a lot of things, but anyway, moving on. So now we have the call. We see those creatures. I said, let's go to... Um, Chapter 5, what I'm doing is, uh, if time will permit, I want to get into the area that's the most difficult and controversial. It's hard to avoid, but if I have time, maybe you can help me with that. Because I'm not saying I know something. I do look at a bunch of different people's opinions just to see if anybody can strike a chord with me. 5 verse 9. Any young guys want to stand up and say that out loud? 
Yeah, go ahead. He's going to do something he's never done before and never going to do again. That sentiment is echoed in other parts of the Bible, like when he talks about when, when the, right before the Lord comes back during that last period of time, a time such as never was before. So it kind of shows you, even though this is uh, 500, almost 600 years before Jesus said those words, you can see that same structure of thinking here and the truth is it's still Jesus inspiring this that's why there's the harmony of the scripture that shows you the one author lots and lots of parallels from the because it's written inspired by one true God and not three different people he says I will do in thee that which I have not done whereunto I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers. That's cannibalism. Did you know that that's on an upswing in some places? It's almost an elite. It's elitists that are doing these terrible things. They called it some kind of soul cooking or something. But uh, those people up there, they're so debauched that they're, they're doing all kinds of wicked stuff. But this is cannibalism um, from uh, starvation from hard times. Yeah. People will do stuff like that when they get desperate. All right. Um, then he says, I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. Um, wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely, because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all the detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare, neither will I have any pity. A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Now that, you see him using those fractional statements. When you read the book of Revelation, the same author says these things again, a third part of the rivers, a third part of this. He uses those thirds again. It's possible that, because in the book of Ezekiel, you're, you can find out they're talking about a certain time and then a certain time. They, there is that real difficult aspect of a prophet and prophecy, prophecy to know when he's uh, having these gaps because there was no chapters or verses so he can carry some thoughts in a package of you know statements that can cover thousands of years. He's not a Gene Dixon or a uh, one of those type of uh, local clairvoyants that only speak about romance and don't get in a car and, you know, lightweight stuff. The, the God that inspired the Bible covers the whole time of man's existence. And right now, 90% of God's word has been fulfilled. So he's already proven himself in so many ways. And they say there's about, the Bible's got about 2,000 prophecies in it. And 90% of them have already happened. So, you know, the credibility is there, but the only thing we're called to do is make sure we divide it right and be careful when we think we understand something because it's like a loaded gun. And you have to, you know, really be careful. That's right. Hallelujah. So, moving along. So, there is judgment. Um, now, the Bible does say that judgment begins where? At the house of God. This is the reason why we, we have already uh, in, entered into the judgment of God because having repented, which means we've, we've turned and we've confessed and we got 
followed the Lord through the water, and now we're following his footsteps. That's what it means. We're, we're, we're on the path. Okay, we don't get washed but once for salvation. How many heard that? We only do salvation washing one time. But there's still more cleansings because we get dirty. Those aren't so much salvation. They're just cleansings. Time of refreshing. We were born again, but there's nothing wrong uh, for a freshening, is there? You know, you can get stagnant. It's time to let it flow again. Ah, breath of fresh air. That's what, when we talk about, uh, I'm going to try to make that point again. So you get washed by the word, but it's not salvation other than cleansing the salvation or keeping the salvation you've got intact and still good for you. I don't have the exact moment when you can lose your salvation. I don't want to split that hair and try to go there. Uh, it's, you're not once saved, always saved. You work out your salvation. You hang on to your salvation. You, I mean, if, if there's anything you want to check on once in a while is uh, how is your salvation doing? Uh, how, how, that's what the book of Ezekiel, we're going to get into that. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is interested in his children's walk. He's saying, I need a man of God to go tell them. You ain't right. You're rebellious. You can't tell people they're rebellious today. Now, there's this, nobody is asking, no, I, nobody's asking you to go contrary to the word of God. Nobody. And nobody's asking you to do anything that's toxic that is going to hurt you. And there's no Kool-Aid in the back room. Nobody's going to drink anything like that. You're not going to be asked to do anything stupid. Nobody's going to ask for your welfare check. Everybody's fine. Don't do that. It's, it's by the book. Everybody say, by the book. By the, book. the thing about Ezekiel is you can see that, that uh, somebody says, well, that's Old Testament. That's been abused, by the way. Yeah, we do not go kill little lambs. We had the lamb. So we got saved by the lamb of God. So I don't need to have another lamb. I just need to stay right with the lamb. I, does, that, does that work for everybody in here? Do you feel bad when you think you might have crossed the Lord? Do you feel a little off? I'm sorry. Broken heart and a contrite spirit. He will not refuse. Forgive me, Lord. Now, he's not going to throw you out, but he wants you to feel bad about it. I'm not going to get rid of my son, but I would like to see some contrition because it means that uh, he's, he's developing the right character. I'm seeing a little bit of righteousness show up. You don't want to like things that are unappealing to God. You really don't. You can say, God, I, I hate the fact that my flesh likes things that God doesn't like. Hello. I wouldn't have to crucify it if that wasn't true. How many understand your flesh is... So let's get back to Ezekiel. Um, where would I take that now? Uh, that was 5, 9 through 12. Let's go to chapter 8. I'm moving right along. 653. We're doing great. What did I say? Chapter 8. Chapter 8. Thank you, Brother Nick. That was good reading. Chapter 8 and... Uh, let's see, is this right? All right. Now, uh, Noah. I had to make sure. Would you be so kind? Uh, that's uh, 8 and 3. You can stand up if you want. Hold on right there. What if when God's wanting to have a move, he had to grab you by the hair and lift you? Here's, a, here's God grabbing the, the prophet. 
That's how my dad used to get me if he wanted my attention. He'd snatch me by the hair. And we'd hold his hand like, ah, man, he put the fear in you. Here's God grabbing him by a lock of hair and lifting him. That's a really a visual there. Go ahead. Very good. Um, so now in Ezekiel, now um, the whole period of Ezekiel covered years. Uh, they compiled all his messages. They transcribed them and stored them somewhere. I don't know if uh, God gave it to the scribe all at once. I don't know how all this came to be, but it's here. And it, it took years. And so now God is in a vision, taking him to the, the highest point of Israel's religious life, to the temple, and he's showing them um, something that is provoking him to jealousy. And God, the button the Bible say, what about God? He's a jealous God. How many have ever experienced jealousy? Now, come on. Don't you be looking at my wife like that. Oh, my wife, if you get near me, she's going, she's going to. What's up, girl? You know, don't you get near that, that big hunk? Jealousy. Jealousy. Jealousy is kind of like a, a rage. It's kind of like an anger. Jealousy is next to uh, killing and murder. I mean, people get jealous. They, they lose their, a bit, their, and here's God. He, he's not just saying I'm jealous. He says, I'm provoked. Now, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, God can get provoked. He's still the same, Brother Smith. We might be in the period of grace, but God doesn't forget that he was the same God that picked up Ezekiel by the hair. And he leaked out in the temple when he made that scourge. Now, it wasn't just for the money changers. It was for the lambs. It was for the cows and the donkeys. He wasn't just about beating people because everything is an animal to him. Even the human creature made in his image. He's just running all this. There are his sheep. He's just running the herd and the flock and the birds and the goats, all the creatures out of, he says, this is not where you belong. Not for that capacity anyway. Some people try to use that to say that he was just a mean, angry God. Well, behold the goodness and the severity of God. He's capable. Yes, you can provoke God to jealousy. Now, he's a long-suffering God. Everybody remember that. But the, the limits of long-suffering... The limits of his mercy. He's a long-suffering God. He, he suffered uh, uh, Esau. He suffered Judas. He suffered a lot of people that failed because they went past where the long-suffering goes. They fell off the flat earth, so to speak. A lot of people fall off because there's an end to that grace of long-suffering. Bible says, I will not always strive with man. There was an end where God said, the, the, I can't do nothing with them no more. Every thought in their head is evil continually. Could he have redeemed them? He had a preacher there, Noah, that preached. He was called a preacher for 120 years. Noah preached by his light of building, maybe by his speech. God has warned. I don't know what all he said in his preaching, but they heard the word. They saw the lifestyle, and they ignored it, and they paid the price. That was the end of the long-suffering. That same thing is going to happen today. There's a point where God says, that's the end of my long-suffering. My cup is full. That's it. You've been telling the people, I'm coming. See, it's, it's starting to become what you might call fatigue. I just can't hear another message on the coming of the Lord. I'm just weary. It's called fatigue. Now, the, the Lord said, be not weary. Be not weary. But 
we can get weary. So we have to, we have to guard against that. But here we go. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. And so um, he says, uh, let's see. Then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way of the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry, right there at church. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Ooh, even the great abominations, that's plural, that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. This is where God is starting to pull away from his own house. It's my house, I gotta leave. This is in Ezekiel to help us grasp. There's not, it, it, we're not guaranteed moves of God. The moves of God are when we're right with God. Now he'll deal, he's speaking to still, while he's pulling away, he's talking to them. Just because there's great preaching and there's still some activity, it's not necessarily that God is moving in. How do you know he's not pulling away? He's dealing while he's leaving. Anytime we can change the course, it's not guaranteed if you're not doing right. There's people that aren't doing right and been told so, know the word of God, and still can act like everything is hunky-dory. And then they assume it must be cool. God is not mocked, the scripture says. Lord, help us. Let's all stop right now and let's worship the Lord. In Jesus' name, help us, God, to understand that whether we can be excited or not, your word is forever settled. Help us to be led right now in Jesus' name. And here's the prophet speaking to a, a people that don't seem to be bothered by the, God doing this. And then he says, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. This is when preaching gets down. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. Now, if you're a Freudian psychiatrist you know if if you get along with the Lord long enough he'll peel it back you know uh, you, that's why the Bible says you don't know your own heart it's very deceitful now you hear but there's a depth some people got scars and pains and damages from childhood and I, 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 in these drug classes, I listen to these people talk about how a relative raped me when I was five years old. And, and they want to know why somebody gets all into drugs and carry on. And they're just so abused and hurt and scarred. And there was no one there to rescue them. And yet there's a God that probably pulled a lot of us out of situations like that. I'm so thankful that I gave God the opportunity to minister to me. Still got issues, like the man said. When I got redeemed, I was a jerk before. I'm still a jerk, but I'm redeemed. And I'm still trying to get the, the jerky out. But I'm not as big a jerk as I was. And it's just hard to, it, it takes a while. I hope I grow up before I leave this life. It'd be nice to finally become a, a grown-up, be mature. Anyway, so he says, and behold, a door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. 
And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In the midst of them stood Jazameh and the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. And that is uh, the Judaism, the Hebrew religion that was perverted by uh, the, you know, like Solomon married these, these Egyptians and they brought all their pagan religion and corrupted and they brought the groves and the trees and all that crazy, crazy worship and they bring stuff in, they bring stuff in. Catholicism is like that. I'm sorry if that offends anybody out there in, in, in La La Land, but it's the truth. They just, um, they just embrace everything. And right now, they're embracing everything. You know, they're kissing all the different religions. I mean, they're going to make a one-world religion. That's something there. And uh, the rabbis haven't joined yet, but they're, they're going to. They're getting close. So that's just what's happening. The, the Bible doesn't tell us that's good religion. He said, to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And uh, Pastor Blankship brought that out real good. That's a good thing to put in your arsenal. What we believe was the, the main course for a cent couple centuries before they decided they want to craft something else. So we're, we got the original thing going on here. Amen. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Yes, he said, and then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. See, what happens is sometimes, who knows why, it seems like God is just not uh, doing as much as he was at, at another time. It seems like he's vacated. Not necessarily so, but you, there's that feeling. He's not seeing. Now, you can't hold, you can't be held all the time, but that would stunt your growth. Sometimes you're just going to have to try without training wheels. You do. And people that give you a hard time, they're not right. Somebody gets up here and, 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 and flubs up or something, or they're trying to, 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 to believe God and do something, only Immature Christians uh, have enjoyed that and think that's funny. It's not the way it works. I remember when I used to surf, we see a, a person coming in the water, and we can tell by how they paddle, how they sit on the board. They used to call them grimmies. There's a grimmie in the water. Look out. Well, what was I? I remember when I couldn't sit on a board. I'd just sit there and tip over. You know? We're all Grimmies at one point or another. You're really grown up when you try to help a Grimmie. Yeah. And in somebody's eyes, everybody in this room is a Grimmie in some form or fashion. God loves Grimmies. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to move along. Uh, what they do in the dark. God sees everything. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's go to uh, chapter 10. Making good time with Ezekiel. Chapter 10 and verse 4. And it says, um, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. He's moving out, but there still moves a God. That's why you, you go to a church that ain't, that you know is not, something's wrong, but they're still having to move a God. Like even some of these churches that don't even know who Jesus is, they don't believe you got to have the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, don't baptize in Jesus' name, but they're having to move a God. Well, that's the goodness of God. You know, because they're believing to the best of their ability, even though they've still got things wrong. We all come out of that. In fact, we wouldn't be the United Pentecostal Church if we didn't keep progressing. And, and the church has to keep progressing. It doesn't mean leave the foundation. It's always going to be the same, but, but that God can move. His glory can be there. I've been in a Baptist revival one time, 
And I thought that was some great preaching. But when they reached their pinnacle, that's when one of our young ministers could have stood up there and brought the house down. God will go as far as they're capable and what they understand. See, if they started seeing the move of God, they would stop it because they think that that would be improper. I've read about that. When, back in the pioneer days when people would start having moves of God, the preachers didn't understand it, so they preached it out. They, they, no more moves of God. Now, we're, now we are proper. Yeah, you're properly dead. No move of God. Anyway, that, that happens. And we can get like that too. We, you know, we don't we want to keep a balance. We don't want to be so proper all the time that we can't let Sister Flossie kick up and scream and run around a little bit. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. What did I say? That was talking about the glory again. And then verse 18 of that chapter, it says... Uh, then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. He's moving. And then in verse 23, it says, there ain't no 23. Uh, but what he does is he, he moved, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh away. And he's talking again some more about how he left. And then, yes, yeah, the next chapter, 23. And the, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. The glory went so far as to go over the city and then, like Samuel, who was it, Samuel or Saul, didn't even know the glory had departed. Who was that? Amen. Okay, um, now let's go to chapter 14. These are highlights from Ezekiel. And then he goes, uh, Then came certain, chapter 14, 1, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. And, I mean... That's, that's modern time when we say that. Yes, you look good, but it's what, what's in here. There's a verse, I've used it so many times, but in the New Testament, James wrote it. He said, the spirit that is in within, within us. Everybody in here has the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is Christ in you. That means uh, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifests. So that's when he says, uh, we will come. That's talking about the Almighty God and the Spirit of the, the risen Christ, which is one. That comes to you. That's the Holy Ghost. That's a special blend of God. And he dwells in you. If you notice that the Holy Ghost don't talk about himself, just like Jesus said, I don't talk about myself. I talk about the, the Almighty God. The Holy Ghost talks about Jesus. Jesus talks about the one true God. These are manifestations, and each one exalts the other one. Ultimately, at the end of it all, the one true God will be rightly focused upon. Even, even the Messiah, the, the manifestation, will hand it up to him. That God will be all in all. How many understand that a little bit? So we have the Holy Ghost in us, in our heart, but that spirit that is within us, again, it says... It, it lusteth to envy. That was one of those phrases. I said, well, what does that mean? So I had to pound around and see what people can bring to me. Amplified, whatever. And what it means is the Holy Ghost that, you know, which is deity in you. It's a hard thought to grasp. Deity in me. He's still trying to take over my life. That's why the Bible says until Christ be formed in you. He's still trying to you know, get a hold of my hands and my feet and my eyes and my mouth and everything. And that's what is going on. How many understand that's what he does when he gets in you? Tries to, tries to get you just like him. He's trying to form, uh, become one. He's one to, to, you you know, we're born again, but that growth is another thing. So, um, 
lusteth to envy. So God in me sees what I'm looking at. Like he said in Ezekiel, I know what's in your heart. He knows the people that really love the house of God. He knows those that really love the people of God. He knows. He can let your heart. He, he, you, we're always being graded, even though, because he's the judge. He's, he can tell when you're being half-hearted, uh, when you're sincere, when you're half, you know, all those levels. But, you know, but he's always uh, looking for the passion, looking for the zeal, because we are made to be those kind of people. How many understands that? Amen. Yeah, we're flesh. We do wind down. But, he, but God does love it when, you, when you're the zeal of the Lord. Of the, it's just, I'm, I'm, so when you were a new convert, people think you're weird. You couldn't wait to carry that 20-pound Bible downtown. You want everybody to know you was a Christian because you had, and, and, and God loves that, that babe, you know, but when we get mature, we don't do that no more. You know, those people aren't coming to God whether you carry that big Bible or whether you're sophisticated. Amen. There's a lady out on the street on Indian River Road. She had signs about Jesus all over her place on the corners, and it was so not our style. We would never do that because it was tacky. And then I, I said, you know what? Go on, lady, whoever you are. Put the big bumper stickers on. It's not about everybody's, well, we want to look appealing. Nobody's coming because you're appealing. There's a spirit draw. The spirit of the Lord bring them. They're not coming because you have edifice. Almost repulsive are the great edifices. Yeah, we like to have new buildings, but we're too much emphasis on building the structure and not building the, uh, the, the people. I mean, not that we're doing that here, but there's a, there's a danger there. Uh, and then people walk around, and pastors are so, I got these great structure. Woo! That's dangerous territory. I got to be careful how I tread on that one. Nice to have a place to come worship and pray. This is a great situation. We're all blessed. But that's not number one. That's right. And, and in our hearts, we, may, we don't want to make idols out of titles or positions. Amen. No. When you're elevated in God, you're elevated in the Spirit. And that should be enough. You know that you did good and that God's blessed you. If somebody gives you a pat on the back, take it. But that somebody promotes you, maybe they made a mistake. That doesn't mean that you're better than anybody else. Yeah, I, I'm just like any other human being. I've seen 90-day wonders. How many of you ever seen one of those? You've got to be careful. I've also seen old people that get cynical. You've got to be careful. Don't want to be one of those. Trying to be the, the person that Jesus wants us to be and, and develop. Yeah, I, I want to give money to the bums on the corner. So I can get blessed. I don't want to give it so somebody take my picture and show everybody what a great guy I am. Amen. Got to avoid the Pharisee spirit. Amen. And do your best not to be seen. Amen. If you're seen, eh, but try not to get, you don't want billboards. That's so icky. And we don't want that. It happens. I got friends that get billing all over, biggest preachers in the world. But they're cool. They don't, it just doesn't make them. They're, they're smart enough not to buy into it. Besides that, the offerings aren't that good anyway. That's right. Let's, let's move it on. So I'm, not, I got, I'm good. Don't let me go past 825. Everybody's watching that one. <laughs> Chapter 18. Chapter 18, chapter 18 and verse 20, 18, 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Verse 21, but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed 
and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. And all his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? That's Jesus. I know you've been a schmuck and you've done things and you feel terrible. You should. But if you'll just turn and follow me and forsake that nasty stuff, I'll clean you up. I'll accept you. There, you can't do nothing about it. There's so, you've done so much stuff. You can never make it right, payback or nothing. I'm going to wipe your slate clean. I'm going to give you a, a new start. The devil's a liar. The soul that sinneth shall die. That's truth. But if you'll turn to God and follow his, uh, in, in our, our dispensation, follow the gospel, repent, uh, be obedient to the teaching of the, the church, the New Testament, and walk right, I'll, I'll take care of you. Can somebody say, praise the Lord? You're saved by grace. That's grace. Grace is saying, I'll give you another chance. I'll give you another chance seven times 70. I'll give you another chance until the door shut. He said, I'm not willing to any your parents. That's one thing that I hang my hat on. I don't care what's going on in your life, how bad you are. If you want to make it while we're still here, the door is open to, to, to make it. That's right. Somebody say, praise the Lord. You've said some bad things about your brother or sister. You've never repented of it. But if you can't remember everything you've done, then you need to say, God, I know I've done something. My, my father spanked us, and, and he, we, we discussed it, and I said, well, I didn't do it. He says, well, this is for the time you, you didn't get it when you missed out. I know you've done something, so this is, this is the pay for that. The Bible says, any man say he has no sin, he's a liar. Anybody here without sin or haven't done any sin since you've been born again, don't raise your hand because you have. God's a holy God. Uh, there's presumptuous sin. There's that you do things wrong by omission. Well, I didn't do that. That's right. There's things you should have done that you didn't do. Sin of omission, sin of commission. Uh, you know, there's so many things. God, forgive me. We want to be pleasing to God. Um, in verse 24, he says, uh, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth uh, and, uh, doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. All I can say is if you're in the middle of sinning, I don't, my theology, I don't know if I can say, well, it's okay. If you're in the middle of adultery and you ain't repented and got out of that mess and squared it with the king, I can't give you a free pass. I don't know if, if it's covered. I, I, I'm going to say I don't believe it is. Just in case somebody says, Brother Austin said he, you might could get away with it. <laughs> Did not say that. But the mercy and the goodness of God, I'm just saying is that the Bible says people that do those things, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So whatever you're doing that's, that's definitely bona fide, verified, you know, stop. Turn. And walk. I'm going to show you something. Because it says that God has. Let's see. Verse 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions. How do you cast a transgression away? I'm not doing it no more. Make you a new heart. And a new spirit. Now this is a thing that I thought was tremendous. David said create in me a new heart. Whereas uh, God is saying. Now, David said that, but God said, uh, you make your heart. Make you a new heart and a new spirit. In other words, don't put it on God like, well, when God wants me to, I'll have it. No. God's saying, you get it. You get your heart right. You get your spirit right. Don't put that on me. That's David. See, don't think about the history of the Bible. David said a lot of things. So did Solomon. Every time somebody says something in the Bible, don't mean that's what God is meaning. It's a good request, but God turned around and spoke for himself and said, you take care of it. Get your heart right. 
Get your spirit right. God, I don't feel nothing. Well, make yourself feel something. Force it. Doesn't the Bible say in the New Testament, reach out? You know, uh, doesn't the scripture also say uh, that we should labor to enter? I mean, it's just work. Sometimes come to church. Well, if somebody doesn't blow the doors off the, off the safe and show me where the treasures are and, and kind of carry me up in a wheelchair and, and dump me out in the presence of God, I, I ain't going to do it. That's right. No, God says, well, you just go ahead and sit back there. Just go ahead. Right? Yeah, I want you saved. I want you to make heaven. I want you to, 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 to be where I'm. I want you to see what I got. But this don't work because you're going to go, hmm. Go ahead. Miss everything because you got that crazy spirit about you. I mean, come on, we'll, we'll tear the roof off the place and lower you down if you can't. But you really can. And he said labor. That means, that means and sometimes, and I, you don't see me getting a spirit much. Like Brother Crutcher said, I'll jump once. But that's equivalent to ten jumps in a young man. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. I use that. Well, believe me, if I jump ten times, my legs are... Uh. But if you could be, see me, I'll, I said, it's time. It's time that I stepped over into that crazy realm of in the spirit. Some of y'all have no idea because you weren't raised in a church like that. But if you've been in one of them Pentecostal churches, we know. And the shepherd looks. He says, you've been in church for a year, two years, and ain't nobody even seen you speaking in tongues. Now, I know you love church, but, but that Presbyterian thing that you're wearing, that, that Calvinist Lutheranism and all that stuff, God bless their religious self, but you need to be in the spirit. You need to get in the Holy Ghost. And, and so, and if you look in Ezekiel, you'll see where God is telling Ezekiel, I'm going to put a spirit in you. I'm going to give you a spirit you ain't never had before. I'm gonna, and that's what we got here. We got all them promises right here. We need to act like this is the earnest of our inheritance. This is the greatest thing God has ever given. And when we start to cheapen it because it's old hat, nothing new here, and you see a new person come in, and they're going, Oh, like James does. He's crying because he felt God. He ain't been filled with God yet. He just felt him and he's stupefied. We've gone on the other side of the spectrum and now we're stupefied again because we, we don't get affected. God. That's time for us to get back into laboring. Come on, somebody. Let's lift our hands and worship me one more time. I got... I better quit with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's 827. Let's all stand together. The, the best part of what I was going to bring, I did not get to, into it. I wanted to so bad. I thought you would have loved it because it deals with what God is going to bring us in the in the thousand year reign for us that are going to be here glorified. And I wanted to talk about that. I want to talk about that. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost. Thank you, everybody, for coming to church tonight. Uh, Brother Pastor Bimber, you good? All right, I'm, I'm obeying the pastor. Uh, we're, we're shutting down in, in 120 seconds. It's customary in these last couple minutes. Um, if you need to be, anybody need uh, uh, be baptized in Jesus' name, we have plenty of people that would love to do that for you. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost yet, please call 757-853-0515. And we've got 20 ministers that would love to bury you in the name of Jesus underwater. Hallelujah. And God would love to fill you with himself. Amen. Let's all lift our hands and love the Lord one more time. In Jesus' name. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Hallelujah. 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 As Pastor Blankenship would say, I feel the Spirit of God. I release this word. 
Hallelujah. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, if you feel the Holy Ghost, praise him a little bit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Save us, Lord. Wash us, God. Deliver us, Almighty God. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Jesus. Greet one another. Shake hands. Love, the, love your brothers and sisters. You're dismissed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.